All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Jonathan Bach, and I'm a senior equity analyst at Wells Fargo Securities, and I follow the business development companies. And this is the panel financing the missing middle market. So today we'll talk about middle market lending trends. We'll talk about middle market private equity. We'll also talk about the return opportunities present in investing in America's middle market economy. You know, now, now b before we get started, it's probably good to at least try to understand what a successful <coughs> panel or presentation really looks like. And, and then, you know, asking around, I think my wife actually summed it up best. She goes, you know, John, a good panel, a, a great panel is a lot like a comet, right? Like a comet. It's dazzling, it's, it's eye-opening, it's awe-inspiring, and most importantly, it's over before you know it. Right, so it's probably good for us to get an understanding of who's in the room. So real quick, let's just do a quick show of hands by poll. How many in the audience here are investment managers? Right, credit investment managers, okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> How about LPs, investors, in, uh, in various credit funds, middle market funds, et cetera? <clears throat> okay. And then, um, I guess, uh, just, People interested in the topic itself, ac academics, et cetera, just around. All right, great, thank you. All right, great, we'll get two or three hands over there. It's fantastic. So let's go ahead and, and introduce our panelists here. And so we'll start all the way over to the right. You know, why don't you go ahead and give us, uh, tell us a little about yourself, give your name, tell us about your firm, and then also define the middle market, considering the middle market means different things to different people. So Lawrence, we'll start with you. Hi, everybody. Lawrence Golub from Golub Capital. We're an investment management firm that focuses primarily on direct lending <coughs> to companies with EBITDA of five to about forty million dollars, uh, principally U.S. based, although a great many of the borrowers have international operations. Uh, my name is Rick Miller. I'm with TCW. Uh, I've been there about sixteen months, uh, although I've been in the middle market much longer than that. Uh, previous firm where we operated as a group was at Regiment Capital, a Boston-based fixed income shop. And our definition of uh, the target market uh, in the middle market is EBITDA is a minimum of 15 million, usually capped out on the upper end by facility size of loans of $250 million on up. So I'm, my name is Jim Moglia. I work at BMO Capital Markets. <clears throat> Excuse me, I got a cold. Apologize in advance. And, um, and I run their leverage finance and debt capital markets business. So for us, since we try to address their needs, we have to have a wide angle on what the middle market is. Sometimes that's size a deal, maybe 500 or 350 and below for a loan. Sometimes that's size a company, a billion and below. But when you get down to it, I think the best guess for us has been EBITDA of 50 plus or minus. I'm Adam Sokoloff. I'm, uh, I run the financial sponsors group at Jefferies. Uh, I've been there 12 years. Jefferies is a full-service investment banking firm, uh, so we work with a wide range of, uh, of companies and sponsors. Uh, we define middle market more broadly than some of the others, uh, probably from an enterprise value standpoint, $200 million or so on the low end and $2.5 billion on the high end recognizing that the, the sponsors and, and, and folks who play in those markets uh, are, are dramatically different in the higher end than the lower end, and, and we have relationships and work with both of those groups. Uh, I'm Barry Volpert at Crestview Partners. Uh, I'm one of the sponsors who works with Adam, and uh, we define middle market pretty much the same way, uh, 250 to $2.5 billion in enterprise value, uh, 50 to $200 million in EBITDA. Okay, great. So to frame this discussion a little bit, you know, th there's really two things. So uh, on one hand, we're talking about the inefficiency of, uh, of the middle market and the capital formation impediments that are there. But it's interesting because there's a tension. <clears throat> we're talking about that inefficiency at a point in the credit cycle with the credit markets being as buoyant as they ever have been. Right? Broadly speaking, there is some amount of inefficiency in the middle market. And if we can bring up slide two here, that'd be great. You can see this inefficiency come out in the data as it relates to looking at middle market <coughs> loan spreads versus their large corporate peers. And so if you look today, uh, 1Q14, right now the average middle market loan spread is roughly 110 basis points higher. Um, actually, f fairly outsized relative to, to recent history. And so really one question to talk to our, our resident non-bank lenders on the panel, you know, so Lawrence and Rick, you know, walk through for us the opportunities that you're seeing in middle market lending today 
And more importantly, why do some of those opportunities exist? The look, looking at the supply of lending and looking at trends historically, I think we think of ourselves as a little bit like First Chicago as a bank in the mid-70s. Uh, we're not a bank, we don't take deposits, we're not regulated, but we're lenders beyond asset value based <laughs> on the enterprise value of, of borrowers. Uh, we're very focused on who the owners are. We're very focused on what our downside is. We lend to healthy businesses. And the opportunity comes from being able to earn decent margins on senior secured debt with low credit losses. Uh, that really, for us, is, is a very important part of the strategy. If you can put up slide 18, please. Uh, to distinguish our strategy from many people, many investors in the middle market who lend to more troubled situations, you know, for us it's all about uh, limiting our defaults, investing to co with companies, lending to companies that are less likely to get in trouble, and being able to provide flexible solutions, high certainty of closing, great flexibility to see opportunities post-closing. We don't have to worry about anybody going through our loan files. We don't have to worry about any regulatory regimes other than some relatively easy to deal with 40 Act issues for our, our BDC. And that intersection of trying to provide solutions to private equity firms like Barry's to help increase the chance that their deal is successful, to help improve the success of their deals, makes us a more valuable partner than lenders out of the regulatory environment. Rick, just curious, you know, when you look at, you know, why you're involved in the space uh, offers uh, some outsized return, but, you know, being a part of it, I'm just wondering, let's get at some of the inefficiencies uh, that are out in the middle market in terms of uh, the areas you play and what you see some of those inefficiencies are. Well, I think, I think where we've seen uh, some of the, the more attractive opportunities for us <clears throat> is at the, in the middle and the upper end of the market. Uh, we like larger, we'd rather lend to larger companies than smaller, uh, and I think when you see uh, some of the larger EBITDA businesses that need loan sizes of 75 or $100 million up to that limit or, or that where, where high yield or high grade or the widely syndicated loan market becomes more of an option at $250 million or so, that's a much more difficult syndication execution in the marketplace because you've got fewer conventional players uh, and the conventional players that have remained have a smaller bite size, a smaller hold size. And I think it's it's created an opportunity for players of size and scale to take big chunky pieces, provide certainty of execution, as Larry said, and, and remove that syndication risk that became uh, a, a, probably a larger opportunity set once the credit crisis came and went in 08, uh, and, and, and hundreds of billions of dollars of conventional lenders disappeared. The European domestic market uh, players, in, in, for the most part, left the syndication market and it created a, a much more uncertain syndication process for those bigger deals, and we've been able to take advantage of that. Makes sense. Now, uh, you know, let's bring up slide three. <coughs> so, so Jim and Adam, I'll, I'll throw this to you as both uh, the resident investment bank as well as commercial bank. So if you look at this following table, here we can see the significant number of financial products. In, in fact, actually, uh, you know, hopefully the arrows uh, don't confuse uh, too many people. I think someone commented that this looked like the Affordable Care Act, um, looking at all the arrows. You, know, you can see that the, the actual uh, products that are offered to large or upper middle market companies is fairly significant. Now, l let's say, you know, Jim, I'm a lower middle market corporation or borrower. Let's say I have EBITDA between five and $10 million and I approach both you to obtain a financing or to, to get a, a transaction done, w what are my options? Well, <clears throat> between five and 25, I think you'd have to divide that between five and 15, 15 and 25, because mm -hmm. they drop off. And, and between 15 and 25, you begin to see that BDCs combined with uh, regional banks, commercial banks, and a little bit of more recently some CLOs financing in the middle market, actually are beginning to close this inefficiency gap. Now, the two, a company exists. It has a management, it has a story. What we're doing in some way is providing it a stratification of engineering, meaning different layers of financing 
which allows a, a risk and reward combination for somebody who wants to make an investment, and liquidity and storytelling. So if we tell the story, provide liquidity, and stratify that company's balance sheet, then they get more efficient financing than they would otherwise. The problem that you get when you get to 25 of EBITDA and lower is they're not large enough to stratify and maintain liquidity. You know, eventually you have $1 of paper that you're trying to find a buyer for. So you have to have a place. And right now we're finding that the market's getting better. And a lot of my partners on the panel are part of the reason in finding a way to bring sophisticated financial options into that 15 to 25 range. Below 15, those are, are, are really best facing the, the, the regional local lending office that knows the guy the best, knows the company the best, and, the, and they, they provide loving care. They don't need all the stratification. Yeah, well, recognizing, uh, I think, first <clears throat> that you know, debt investors, unlike equity investors, are focused on the downside. They want to make sure that at the end of the day, they get their interest paid and they get paid back their principal at some point in time. Um, and, and so uh, in, in the context of smaller businesses, I mean, the, the, the logical reason why smaller companies typically can get less leverage and pay higher rates is because they're typically viewed as being riskier. Because it's easier for a company that's doing you know, $10 million of EBITDA to disappear than a company that's doing $100 million of EBITDA. And that's sort of the mindset that, that you know, the debt markets have about smaller companies. And I, and I agree, I think, you know, as, as we look at the market, um, you know, we recognize that as we've grown the firm and, and, you know, done larger and larger transactions, what we found was there weren't as many folks focusing on those sub $50 million EBITDA businesses from a lending standpoint. Um, you know, folks like Lawrence have you know, built a, a great business doing that. Um, and so about six months ago, we actually uh, allocated about a billion dollars of capital in the finance company that we have, which is a billion out of six and a half billion dollars, specifically to do club lending transactions in smaller <coughs> deals. Uh, where we're taking positions and putting them on the balance sheet, you know, say 10 to $25 million of, of hold positions. Um, but again, I mean, the, the credit work that one does is no different than what you do for larger businesses. You just have to ascribe certain risk to a smaller business in addition to, you know, just sort of the, the regular kinds of, uh, of risks that, that you're looking at. And size, how does that play? What's the market position? How is there a reason for this company to exist? Could it disappear tomorrow? How easily can that happen? And, uh, you know, I think you've got to price it accordingly. We, we, we are in an environment right now where credit is so freely available at such incredibly low rates and high leverage that, you know, uh, we'll get into this later, but I think a lot of people would argue that, that investors are not being paid for the risk relative um, to the rates and terms that you're seeing on transactions. You know, Adam actually brings up a very good point. So smaller company, smaller EBITDA, um, higher risk, right? It makes intuitive sense. But then uh, if we can pull up slide 18 one more time, and I'll throw <coughs> a quick question to Lawrence. You know, if you look at your default experience uh, relative to the S&P leveraged loans, right, one could argue that obviously there's an amount of credit work there in, the, in those numbers, of course, uh, uh, given, uh, given the strength of, uh, of Golub. But is there some amount of inefficiency when you focus on those smaller borrowers that allows you to negotiate better terms and better covenants and perhaps gives you an even better risk return profile than maybe what you'd see in larger markets? Sometimes. Uh, I think that there's a trade-off. Without a doubt, middle market, as we define the term, includes covenant packages that provide a somewhat earlier tripwire than in broadly syndicated lending. So in Broadly syndicated loans today, many, many deals are covenant light, uh, whereas in middle market, virtually none are, are covenant light. Uh, that matters in a relatively narrow segment of deals. It matters in deals that get in trouble, where the sponsor or owner and the lender disagree about what, what should take place. So it does happen, and it's important. Uh, I, I think when we look at middle market transactions and what distinguishes our 
performance relative to the markets. It's more about the quality of our underwriting decisions than it is about covenants. Mm -hmm. I think talking about the market generally, covenants are one of the trade-offs you get, one of the benefits you get for giving up liquidity. Okay, appreciate that. Now, maybe jumping to, to, to the actual equity side of, of the balance sheet here for a moment. So, Barry, as a, uh, as a middle market private equity investor, maybe walk us through the value proposition you're seeing in middle market PE today. Okay. Uh, so, this is an ironic panel for me to be on because everyone else is a lender and I'm a borrower. And, and what we're hearing is our, we'll be gentle. our lenders <laughs> basically are saying how they can get high interest rates and tough terms on borrowers like us. And, and the, the ironic thing is that in, in the part of the business where we participate, we're happy with that because the harder it is to borrow money and the more expensive it is, the lower the valuation. And the easier it is to borrow money and the cheaper it is, the higher the valuation. So we want to buy companies when it's really hard to borrow money. And it's okay with us if we have to pay a little bit more because we're not borrowing that much. And then when we're selling, which is what we're doing right now, uh, we like it when the credit markets are very robust because some other private equity firm or the public market will pay more if the credit is cheaper. So in, in some sense, half the time, through the cycle, we're probably aligned as a private equity firm with the, uh, the credit-oriented firms. And, and I think what Lawrence said really resonates, which is in the end, the underwriting and the credit selection is what differentiates people in, in, uh, in that market. Now, in terms of, of how we see the, the private equity market and why middle market is attractive, uh, and, and why is it possible that they can earn more and we can earn more, uh, it's because there are real increases in valuation with scale. And so we have a couple slides here. You know, nine, uh, slide 20 shows private equity returns are, are higher than any other asset class over any reasonable period of time. And so, um, so we can raise money as, a, as an industry and borrow a lot as an industry because of that. Slide 21 shows that middle market firms outperform the large firms. Uh, how, however you measure it, multiple of money or IRR. Slide 22 shows that upper middle market where we are, now you'd expect us to present this, this slide, uh, is the sort of the, the most attractive slot within the middle market. Uh, but you can see all the middle market <coughs> slices on that chart are higher returns than the uh, mega funds. So why is that? And this is the punchline, page, slide 23 and slide 24, on average, middle market firms are paying lower prices and they're borrowing less money. So slide 20, th this slide is, is we're borrowing less money and the next slide is we're paying lower prices. Mm -hmm. And so when, when I, I look at where we are in the food chain and how can everybody here outperform, uh, the answer is that we're basically buying smaller companies or medium-sized companies and growing them. And the financing cost is important but in, in the long run, uh, in effect, if you can grow the businesses, you can sell them for a higher multiple and higher earnings, and that provides the juice for everybody. So how do you do that? Uh, and, and what we would say is three or four things. One is, is you can buy at lower multiples because you don't have a public market as an alternative, and so you get paid for illiquidity. Two is you can add more value to mid-market companies because they don't have the full uh, depth of management and breadth of expertise in-house that a company with $50 million of EBITDA might have. And so as a private equity investor or an active owner, you can help them recruit new management, like Hayward Donegan right here, the CEO of one of our portfolio companies. You can help attract new customers. You can help uh, international expansion. You can help with international <coughs> M&A. Uh, and then finally, you can sell to somebody who's bigger, who's used to paying higher multiples, and they can borrow cheaper which enables them to do it, and then you start all over again. Appreciate that. So, you know, there's one key buzzword. I mean, we talk about the inefficiencies in the middle market, or we talk about <coughs> the ability to, to lend to companies that, that might not be able to access the capital markets as broadly. But the real item that I heard from the credit markets panel this morning is this key buzzword, froth, right? Uh, there's credit froth. And, and if we pull up slide nine, there's some amount of relative credit froth in the middle market today. And while the numbers are small, you can look that 
uh, at the upper end of the middle market, just looking at, uh, at these stats here, is that Covenant Light issuance in that upper end of the middle market is at an all-time high. In fact, levered loan fund flows into the middle market is also at a 2007 level peak. And then in addition to that, there's still some, let's say, tepid amount of, of M&A or deal flow to go along with that. So, so really the question is, going back to starting with Rick and then moving to Lawrence, is you know, where are uh, the froth, where is the froth in the credit market, particularly in the middle market uh, today? And how have you run into that on recent transactions? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's difficult to deny that the credit markets in general have, are, are more aggressive today uh, and as, as aggressive as they've been since the market crashed uh, once again. But I think this, and this is probably speaking more to the investors in the audience, is, is that, you know, where, where you put your money and what managers you, you utilize ultimately in the marketplace uh, will determine that frothiness and where it is. I, I think it's... I think it's uh, a, a great sin uh, for lenders to give up on covenants. Uh, it's one of the two things you'd, you want to be a bank lender for. It's floating rate and your senior secured with a do-over if people underperform. To give that away is, is ridiculous. Uh, and especially in the middle market as you're trading off liquidity as well. And so I think adherence to, to, to disciplines within the market and, and underwriting credits to, to repayment rather than allowing, you know, assuming a market's going to take you out or a, uh, another another uh, issuance, if you will, uh, I think speaks to why the underwriting standards uh, may be a little bit better in the middle market than they are in the higher liquid markets where underwriters aren't holding paper, mm -hmm. uh, where middle market people have exposure and they're, in our case, underwriting and keeping and holding large chunks of these loans. So I, I think I think the, the market frothiness is, is what you allow yourself to do as a lender. If you're going to capitulate, give up on covenants, give up on price, and be a relative value lender, uh, you're going to be a more of a beta producer and you're going to underperform and mark credit markets implode. And you'll ride the bull market when credits do, credit markets do well. I think to survive, and certainly how we've survived over the last 14 years in a variety of cycles, is to not be a relative value lender, is to stick to disciplines on documentation, stick to disciplines on, on, on risk, uh, and, and certainly on pricing, which is probably the easiest of the three to stick to. But, you know, when we're right, we get the money back. Um, when you're wrong is, is, is when you have, you know, you have to have a lot of explaining to do. And uh, in our business, you just, you can't, you can't get it wrong. So when I see the froth or you see it identified, it's typically in that more conventional area of the market where you still have, you know, cheap access to capital, uh, small holds, uh, and, and less accountability to, you know, ultimately your boss or your, uh, the provider of capital. So, so, Lawrence, let's say uh, uh, Barry brings a, a deal to market, a uh, middle market company. Uh, in today's environment, there is a significant amount of demand uh, to provide debt paper. Um, who are the competitors? And who are the competitors uh, perhaps broadly described as those that are acting irrationally? You mean in addition to our panelists? <laughs> 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 Well, Barry operates at the uh, at the upper <coughs> what, what what he describes as upper middle market. It, it falls outside of what we describe as middle market. Uh, I think that in in today's environment, they would have a wide range of options, including BMO, Jefferies, Credit Suisse, possibly uh, J.P. Morgan. Uh, it is possible in some of his transactions that some of the buy and hold lenders like us or perhaps like Aries BDC uh, could could be involved but I'm I'm guessing that uh, Barry's Barry and his firm would tend to choose a syndicated execution as opposed to a buy and hold execution and a syndicated execution in that size is the right corporate finance answer as long as the company doesn't hit some bumps. Barry and I would probably disagree about the value to place on the, if it hits a bump. Uh, but if he's buying the business, he's pretty optimistic about it. And he's a smart guy, so he's probably right. We look at those kind of questions differently. Coming back and combining this question with your earlier question, where's the froth? The froth would be in the second lien portion of the execution. Uh, second lien investors today 
are operating in a different reality than the one I reside in. It, uh, the attachment points for second lien debt are generally north of four times. That means the first dollar of second lien debt stars, starts sometimes as high as five times cash flow and extends downward from there. So uh, Barry may really be excited by the growth prospects of, of a company. Well, actually, a different Barry, probably not Barry, would, would pay up. But many transactions might go at <laughs> 10 times EBITDA or, or even more. And that might well be a fair price for purchasing the company. And so a second lien lender might say, OK, I'll go to six and a half times leverage. It's only a 55% loan to value. But the reality is the last four or even five turns of EBITDA are value based on the growth potential. That company's only going to get into trouble when it doesn't have the growth. So you'll, you can't look, I think, rationally at an enterprise value cushion based on an EBITDA multiple where the owner or buyer is paying for growth. The history of second lien disappointing investors in default situations with very low recovery values is, I'm, and I'm paraphrasing something from, from this morning, I'm, I find it astonishing that only four years after the last time we learned this lesson, <coughs> the investors in second lien are setting themselves up to learn the, learn the lesson again. I see offering materials and fund descriptions that talk about the wonders of investing in first lien debt, and they're offering double-digit unlevered returns. And when you really read about the portfolio construction, a substantial amount of it is second lien. Well, maybe semantically, second lien, first lien debt is first lien debt. But that's not the risk return people are buying, and I wonder if they know that. So, so a quick question. So we talk about froth, whether it's in the second lien or, or not, and this goes to both Adam and, and Jim. You know, I, I, there's a little bit of a disconnect. We hear about credit froth. Uh, we see that purchase price multiples are higher, yet M&A, at least as we'd all describe it in this room, is relatively tepid. And, and so it's, uh, it's not an easy, uh, easy question, but why? Well, let me let me take that. Um, I, you know, first of all, I would before I before I answer that, I would I would just say that, um, notwithstanding the fact that that new deal activity, new buyout activity, is not what any of us would guess it would be in given where the markets are. Um, obviously, those deals that are happening are happening at you know very high prices. You know, the number one complaint when I walk into a meeting, you know, on a daily basis with private equity clients is there's nothing for us to look at, and or not enough, and uh, we just got booted out of a process and we bid 10 times. You know, what's going on? Um, and, and we've looked at lots of reasons why there isn't more activity. Um, you know, one of the panelists this morning uh, uh, on the PE panel, John Donhockel, talked about the fact that, um, you know, that many of the, uh, of many private equity firms have sold uh, some of their best companies in the last couple of years. And, and what's interesting is they've done that um, despite the fact that they still hold many portfolio companies going back to 2005, 2006, companies that have been in the portfolio now for six, seven, eight years. Notwithstanding that, um, they've made some very good investments in you know, 2008, 2010, and, and have sold those companies while still holding on to the older companies. Why? Because they paid big prices for those companies in 2006, 2007, and it's questionable as to whether or not they have, will generate you know, good returns. In fact, many of them won't generate good returns on those investments. What we have seen, and again, I think it's too early to term it a trend, is that those firms that have either sold companies more recently, um, successfully, companies that they've purchased in the last three or four years, and or have gone out and successfully raised a new fund, seem more open to starting to, you know, let some of the older stuff get, you know, out into the market, recognizing that they're not going to make a good return, but they've got some air cover, if you will, uh, based on some of the more recent successes, either selling businesses or recapping business or what have you. So we're starting to see some of that. But the other thing that, that we're seeing here, and we see it in Europe as well, is the IPO market. And in many cases, if you look at consumer growth, for example, you know, given the prices that those companies are trading for, um, one is hard-pressed to 
go out and sell the business when you can get two, three multiple points more in the public markets for growing companies in those sec in that sector and others, as opposed to putting the sale, you know, the, the company up for sale. And if you look and see what the trend is, the trend is an IPO that is a small IPO. Very often, there's little or no uh, secondary selling, so it's a deleveraging transaction. Call it a hundred, hundred and fifty million dollar IPO, paying down leverage, and it's only on the sec, you know, the next deal six months later or sooner, I'll get to that in a minute, where you're seeing them exit. But it's happening regularly. That's the playbook. And sponsors who have been loath over you know, the last many years to ever take a company public because the view is, well, you know, uh, it takes forever for me to get out, and, and what happens if I can't? Well, the reality is it's happening much more quickly. We're seeing you know, six-month lockups. Typically, if the stock's performing well and the company's performing well, those lockups are being lifted. It's the underwriters who have to uh, approve that. And, and if it's working well and you put very little stock out there in the first place, you have demand in the marketplace. So we lift the lockups early. We sell some stock. You, know, you have another you know, 90 days after that or so. You have another lockup period that expires or you lift early. And you're seeing people get out much more quickly in IPOs. So they're electing to go in that route rather than a sale. And notwithstanding what we've always seen in terms of size, there are smaller IPOs. If you've got a growth company, smaller IPOs are working in this market. And so sponsors who never took companies public before are doing so. It's gone from, as I describe it, it's gone from the appendix in the strategic alternatives pitch to the first bullet point. Everybody wants to talk about IPO. Appreciate that. Now, maybe turning the uh, turning the page to fundraising, right? And I find a I, I find a, a, a it's a two part play, right? So we talk about how returns in the middle markets have effectively been compressed. There's froth. Spreads have come in. Um, that's uh, that's on the return side of the ledger. But then when you look at the demand or uh, the demand for funds in the middle market. Uh, this has actually been uh, as strong as we've ever seen it. And so we could pull up slide 13. You can see that demand for middle market buyout funds or in demand for middle market loan funds is actually among the highest uh, when you survey LPs that are interested. Um, when you ask them what portion of PE are you most interested in, they will say middle market, whether it's in buyouts or in Europe. And so, Barry, one question for you. Walk us through the fundraising dynamic for private equity firms, particularly middle market private equity firms in today's market. And how does that translate in, the, in light of the fact that new deal flow remains relatively tepid? Sure. Well, you have a paradox, right? Because on the one hand, no one ever got fired for buying IBM stock, right? And the IBMs of our industry are Blackstone, KKR, Carlyle, <coughs> the famous names. On the other hand, if you look at the data that we were looking at earlier, the returns in the middle market have been higher. Uh, and so most institutional investors today view middle market as a bit of the flavor du jour. And there's definitely a fun flow towards middle market. And then the issue is how do you distinguish yourself? Because there are a lot of firms. Uh, and obviously, uh, the most important thing is the returns and how people performed through the cycle how many companies they lost, how many companies they, they, they profited from, uh, how many companies they saved is very important, and then how they took advantage of the opportunities post Lehman Brothers where, where people have generated some, some very high returns. The other thing that's happening, and, and it kind of touches on what, what Adam was alluding to, is you had a period of time where institutional investors were, were way over allocated because they were assuming they would receive substantial distributions out of their portfolios for the funds they invested in 2005, 6, 7, and they got nothing because nobody was selling because their companies were, were underperforming and the market was down. In fact, you saw a robust secondary market of private equity commitments because people couldn't afford to pay to fund. So now you're seeing the reverse. Distributions are at record levels and the stock market has appreciated. So the numerator has gone down in terms of the private equity capital deployed and the denominator has gone up. And so you've seen a complete reversal in the institutional investors' allocations, and they need to invest more. That problem or opportunity, if you sit where, where we all sit, is going to increase this year 
because with the, the public market where it is, many private equity firms are selling both the, the companies they invested in pre-Lehman, which have had time to rebound, and the companies they invested in post-Lehman because the public market is so, so attractive. And so, you know, at our firm as an example, distributions will be more than double capital calls this year. And similarly, the same thing was true last year. And so all of the institutions, as they do their budgets, they're finding that they have more allocation for new private equity than they thought they would. And then the question is, how do they find the best players in the middle market? Uh, because they, they know the data, but they're not as familiar with the names. Uh, and so it's, it's a robust market. It takes time for people to get to know the institutions. But uh, I, I would say it's probably a very good time uh, to raise money in the middle market. So turning over to the debt side, um, Rick, and, uh, or uh, uh, let's, start, let's start with just Lawrence. When you think about loan SMAs or just exposure to middle market loan activity, um, what are you seeing on the fundraising side uh, at Gollum? Uh, fundraising for us and fundraising for any even semi-established manager is the easiest it's been in a long time. Uh, I'm thinking right now about uh, Ken's line from his uh, remarks yesterday. He said, the most important wor word in the United States, hope. Uh, people don't have a lot of places to go. And what resonates with me about investor interest is conservatism. So the folks who we're working with tend to be people who you know, might feel that there's been spread compression, but maybe have some concerns, either need current income or have some concerns about uh, potential volatility. Uh, but I, I think investors, asset managers, we're all kind of flummoxed by what the Federal Reserve and central banks of all over uh, the world have done. We're, we're in a territory where nobody really knows what's going to happen with that. So, so in addition to fundraising, may, maybe taking a broader step back and just looking at the middle market historically, right? And so, so Jim, I'll, I'll throw this question to you only because you've seen a number of different markets over time. How would you define the middle market asset class today um, with respect to some of the other asset classes that you've built or participated in over your many years? Well, first, I think you have to look at the middle market as part of a terrain. And it's, it's a little bit of a rural part of the terrain. And, and a lot of what we look at, we talk about froth and craziness. We have a, de a demand side, monetary policy, fiscal policy. We throw money at things. And so when a rural person looks at the city, when there's craziness going on, he says, those people in the city are crazy. And, and I'm here out in the country where I have a normal life. And I think it's attractive to a lot of people that are otherwise dealing with froth, no covenants. They're watching the bond market create a lending demand, create funds that are designed as if they were bond funds to buy loans and call them second liens. And that does sometimes wash out to the rural community of the middle market. But it does it a little bit, and it still leaves a competitive advantage so that we have you know, great equity opportunities, great debt opportunities that are still available there. Now, if you look back historically, let's go to like 1980. There was a middle market problem. Again, oddly enough, every time you have a problem, there seems to be a government ox on why there is a problem. Back then, the government wanted everybody to invest in investment grade companies, and they wanted banks to invest in certain things banks had to do. And unfortunately, what we see today is 40% of, of your employment is coming from the middle market. That would have been the case back then. Unfortunately, they missed the part of the tree where all the growth is. And so back then, you know, Mike Milken, we have to, we have to draw him out because this is his conference. He said, there's a big opportunity in here. And he's a social scientist more than he's a financier. He says, there's, a, there's an opportunity here to help society. And you could see that he's a social scientist by seeing what this conference is about. So he said, there's a gap. There are institutions that are forced to invest in things that can't pay their deposits the adequate return, and there's companies that can't get adequate capital. So he, at the time, created the high yield market, or, try, or, or was 98% was of creating it. But also at the time, agents did small equity deals and traded them. Other bond guys that weren't Drexel would do a $30 million bond deal, and it was liquid. Liquidity means you didn't need covenants. Also at the time, sponsors were barely there. 
The biggest change, I think, outside of the government giving free money away in the last 30 years is that the financial sponsor community now plays a tremendous role in discovery of investment opportunities. There are so many of them, they're so well funded, they're so smart, they have such great staff that they've actually crowded out what I used to do for a living, which is try to find great investment opportunities. They do that. And when they're doing it in the middle market, they're able to capture that spread that otherwise is gone in, in, the, in the city where froth and the supply, demand side money is thrown. So over time, what you see is that there's, there's a sign curve. You know, obviously markets are up, down, up, down. The middle market has been much more consistent. That it's telling a story that you have to be close to, understand. What we have these days that helps a lot is verification of that story. Um, the, 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 the sponsor community makes a small story larger. One of the reasons is if you don't like the deal you buy from them, you know, you could penalize them next time. So they're more than one deal at a time. They're a portfolio of deals. And then what we do for a living at Bank of Montreal is we try to put partners like, you know, Lawrence, we've done business with him, partners like Rick, et cetera, into transactions to try to finance the middle market business. So in some extent, it's, it's a little bit of uh, Groundhog Day. The problems we face today with the middle market is no different than the problems we faced in the 80s. And the answer continues to be stuff that I wish was more interesting Step up, make liquid things happen, do your homework. And if you do that, you have access to great opportunities. So, so throw this out, because this is a $64,000 question. We'll start with Barry. So, you know, there's interest in the middle market, no doubt about it. That's drawn several pools of capital, be they pensions, be they institutional investors, permanent capital vehicles, uh, to invest in this middle market asset class, be it debt or equity. Here's the question. You know, that's a result of the fact that middle market returns right now, while still compressed, are giving outsized return relative to what other people could find in, uh, in other asset classes. What happens when rates rise and that relative return dynamic or that outsized return in the middle market gets compromised a bit? Does all the money that's been raised in the middle market stay? Well, um, I'm not sure I, I agree that higher interest rates leads to compression and returns. Okay. So that's really the, the place to start. You know, put this in context, there's $150 trillion of assets and $1 trillion of private equity. <clears throat> and so that outperformance chart is on less than 1% of the assets out, outstanding. And there's $200 billion of mid-market, and we're outperforming the other $800 billion of private equity. So we're talking about, you know, one 20th of 1% of the total outstanding um, investment assets. And can that piece uh, continue to outperform? And I, I hope James is right and that we can for the reasons uh, that he said. But, you know, what I worry about more than interest rates <clears throat> increasing and the inflation that is likely to come with that is the opposite. Because if we have inflation and interest rates increase, what happens is the debt that we borrowed is easier to repay because our earnings grow and our nominal returns increase faster because we're levered and we're getting higher returns. So, you know, if you look at private equity returns in the mid-market in the 80s and 90s, and one of the things about the chart I showed earlier is there was no mega fund table for 20 and 25 year returns because there were no mega funds back then, is you had, you know, 5% 10 year treasury rates and you had 3% inflation and you had 30% IRRs in private equity or in the 80s and 20% of the 90s. For us, if we had an increase in interest rates and a modest increase in inflation, we would show much better returns and we'd make more money. And so that's not what I worry about. I worry really about the reverse uh, because if we have deflation and deflation in, in commodity prices, even if interest rates are zero, uh, y y the implication- They're not gonna be zero. Right. <laughs> of course, 10 basis points, sorry. <laughs> No, uh, I meant with the spread. I didn't. The yeah, spread's well, not going to zero. He's not lending you money for nothing. Even for you. I meant for trades. <laughs> thank you. So, <laughs> so I, I think an interest in, uh, a modest increase in rates together with a modest increase in inflation would probably be good for the mill market. Yeah. Uh, Lawrence, so would you agree? Because to the extent that interest rates increase and perhaps you're getting better returns on large corporates and maybe that gap. Um, that we've seen now, which is so wide on middle market loans today, is what's attracted people to the middle market loan dynamic. 
Does that change, you know, particularly for some of the investors that you've seen enter the middle market over the last two years? Yes. Why? We're in a funds flow driven world right now. And uh, there is huge amounts of capital coming in and out of every asset class. And while the middle market is sticky, it's got better returns than broadly syndicated, it's got lower leverage, it's got covenants. <clears throat> Some of the people who are pursuing middle market investing today are doing it because they're saying no to other things, not because they're natural investors in middle market credit. I'm not speaking to the private equity side. I don't have an informed opinion about flows of funds into the private equity funds. But on the credit side, there are investors for whom this is not a natural asset class. Some of them don't know it. I talked before about, I think, misperceptions about the safety that a second lien provides. Similarly, I think a great many investors in some of the middle market type credit assets don't understand that it's an illiquid asset class and that they can't all have their money back at the same time. And that if a circumstance like late 2008 comes up again, the market price will not necessarily be connected to the true underlying value. See, I, I think Lawrence is right. I think what's happening is there are a group of investors who will not accept a 3% return. And so a 3% liquid investment grade return is kind of the best you can do. And so they can take illiquidity or they can take credit risk. And the middle market lending side offers less credit risk and more illiquidity to get to a 5 or 6% return. And they're basically saying, that's good enough. If you have inflation come back and nominal returns in corporates or investment grade bonds go back up, I, I think you're right that the fund flows will go the other direction. I, listen, I, there are some businesses that have been created over the last several years, given the interest rate environment, that I don't anticipate going away. Now, I don't know that there'll be as much capital in these, in some of the, you know, with, with some of the middle market areas as there as there are today but you know we see this kind of flow I mean you talk about covenant light loans covenant light loans started with you know billion dollar financing packages and they moved down and they moved down and they still move around I mean we have middle market deals who everybody you know knows about a covenant light loans that somebody maybe somebody did it that they know another private equity guy maybe they're a little bigger but hey why can't I get that covenant light loan and people ask for it and people push it and before you know it, in this environment, the size deal that gets a covenant light loan keeps coming down and coming down. And I'm not saying it goes forever. In fact, as the market has sort of you know, gotten a little choppy over the last few weeks, that's sort of pushed back up. And I mean, that's, that's what happens in these markets. You know, we, we see things go back and forth, and there's no reason to believe that, it, that it's going to be any different this time around. Um, but what's interesting that I see in terms of private equity today, more so than ever before, is that the, these private equity firms are very focused on who they are borrowing money for from, okay? They want to know who their lenders are. Even in syndicated transactions, um, you know, we see credit agreements that limit, that, that name specific investors that can't buy the debt. And why? Because because people have a history of working with them in troubled times and don't like the reaction that those investors or how they've acted in those situations. So, um, so I think, you know, we, again, they've, they've never been more focused and it, and it also goes to what, you know, what Lawrence does, what we're trying to do more of, what Rick does, which is people want to know their lenders. I've worked with Lawrence before. I know how, I know that, 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 he, that he lends as a partner and that if I hit a bump in the road, not that he's going to be perfect, but I know how he's going to be because I've worked with him before and I know that he holds the paper. And I think that type of relationship <clears throat> will continue notwithstanding where interest rates go. And I think that private equity, you're even seeing those kinds of deals happen in bigger deals where you're seeing whether it's a second lien or a mez or whatever it is, you know, direct placement with somebody based on who the lender is. And I think that helps 
the middle market continue to operate more like it does today, albeit rates go up, you know, spreads will you know, tighten between the two. That'll happen, but that, that always happens. You know, we like to, sorry, we, all of us like to see the ebb and flow of markets. And unfortunately, every once in a while, we got to face things like regulations changing. And the regulations come in and they contort everything. You and then you got slide to, 14. You got to react to this. And in some ways, you know, it, it's like watching an old silent movie where there's the runaway train. And, and you don't know whether you're watching a tragedy, well, because you can't hear what they're saying. You don't know whether it's a tragedy or a comedy <laughs> until you see whether the brake, when applied, falls off in his hand. Then you know, okay, this is going to be fun. And so what happens is the government, uh, a little bit like, um, a little bit like a, a prohibitionist who works at nights as a bartender, they drive extra liquor into the system and then they go to the day job and they say, by the way, you guys can't be doing cov light. You can't be doing six times leverage deals. Make sure you're paying down all of your debt, your senior debt, you know, in five years, et cetera, et cetera. And so what happens is where we go was a mid market team because none of us are going to be leaving the mid market. The mid market might get deflated, but all of the ones up here will still be doing what we do for a living, which is that. But whether or not the frolicking craziness runs away or comes, stays closer is a, a lot, I think, related to whether or not regulations stick and whether they're even articulated consistently. I, I really don't think there's a fear of, of, of <clears throat> capital fleeing this space in droves in part because of this, this graph, the banks aren't coming back. The private equity folks, uh, the proliferation of middle market private equity firms isn't going away. Uh, that capital has to be supplied by somebody. And it, we're, you know, the, 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 the space is delivering in a you know, floating rate, senior secured return profile for investors. Uh, it, it, I think, I think you, it's, it's been created by, because of a supply demand issue, not a ret rate of return issue. So. I think on the margin you could see some folks that are just chasing floating rate and are afraid of duration, but in, in, in the macro basis, this market is, is certainly evolving and we're just replacing the providers of capital. The conventional players are leaving and it's right. non-conventional players coming in. Well, so then the question is, who is the lender that is most apt and most built to survive in this current new regulatory environment, right? Jeffries. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I, I think... Wait a second. I, it's like the cockroach that survives the nuclear holocaust. No. <laughs> survives. Ouch. Ooh. <laughs> I, think, I think in some ways that's, that, you know, that, that's part of the answer, and it's the unfortunate part for what we do, because I think what makes the opportunity so appealing is it's a, the middle market's a very large, fragmented place, and it, it, it helps differentiate if you can originate transactions, and you're not waiting and passively waiting for uh, deal flow to come to you from an investment bank. You, know, you see the disintermediation in the bigger markets, whether it be high yield or widely syndicated loan market, where you have passive lenders taking little pieces of big deals and they're outsourcing the diligence and they're outsourcing the origination and the credit decision and they, be they become commoditized. And you see rates uh, or spreads compress and you see degradation of documents and, and structure. They've allowed themselves to be marginalized and I think one of the nice things about the middle market is the origination expertise matters. And having that capability, having size and scale to go along with it, I think are the kind of things that will allow you to, to, to traffic in this space on a consistent basis, basis and differentiate yourself from a lot of the other marginalized or com commoditized lenders out there. So, so yeah, I, I completely so, agree with that. And, yeah. and I think the investors who are more successful right. through the cycle will be the investors who understand that desk buyers can't outperform. If you're a direct lender, a direct origination model, and you're bad, that's just as bad. But if you're good, you build a franchise and that's where you can deliver. It's, it's not so much delivering outsize return on assets. It's delivering better net returns after credit losses. Desk buyers are gonna have average or worse returns. The smart direct lenders, are going to have better net returns, and the better investors are going to understand that and act on it. Jim, Jim, so. Jim said something to me before the panel here, and I think it's very true, uh, which is, you know, I, I think most of us up here, um, both historically and even uh, recently, you know, we've not been playing with huge balance sheets. And when you're not playing with a huge balance sheet, um, that diligence is that much more important. 
because at the big banks, it's really the biggest question that gets asked the committee is, can you sell this? It's not as much about the credit. And, you know, I think most of us up here approach credit in that sense, which is we're underwriting it to own it. And if that's the case, uh, you better be really sure about what you're doing and not just let, you know, the excitement of the deal run away with you. Um, you've got to really be focused on, on the underwriting aspect of, of the business. The rest of that conversation, which you would be embarrassed to say, is that was a compliment of the Jeffries franchise and culture because they do have a focus on investors. And back in the old days, if you were, you know, the intermediary, the intermediary didn't take a principal position like a lender does today. And they were totally focused on getting sources of capital, whether it be your source of capital, yours or yours, to get that source of capital into the deals. And then you had to spend all your time making sure the deal was good, making sure it was liquid, and putting your good housekeeping seal of approval on it. If you don't have access to capital as a culture, and Jeffries has plenty of capital, but as a culture, they're much more like the way I grew up, they're going to be very good at doing that. Now, as a commercial bank, what BMO has is entrenched relationships because we've been lending money for a long time. And that's very, very good. But if, if you treat that like a 25-year marriage, which is supposed to be great because you've been together for 25 years, you're going to lose your spouse. You've got to keep reinventing yourself. We have to reinvent ourselves to recognize that very often we might not be the best lender. Sometimes Lawrence is the best lender. The good right. news about Lawrence's team is their credit culture is very similar to ours. We find very often we know if we get there, they're likely to get there. And we can now take risks we otherwise wouldn't. So we're all migrating into a different role than we would have had otherwise. The commercial banks surviving regulation have to be intermediaries. We're going to be held responsible if I sell you a bad deal, even if I sell myself down to zero. So I've got to be much better at making sure you don't buy bad deals from me. I've got to be much better at doing what Jeffries has been doing a longer time than we have. And then use our relationships to try to give us a head start there. But it's a very fascinating time. So, you know, in light of froth, in light of all that we've discussed, here's, <clears throat> here's a quick question. You know, and we'll start with Lawrence. Lawrence, if you're looking at the environment today, what keeps you awake at night? I, I, what keeps me awake at night is how so many people act as though they have an understanding of what the intermediate to long-term consequences of the monetary inflows by the Fed and other central banks are. I'd, I'd be happier if people expressed more uncertainty about it. Uh, so that would be, for me, the, the, the biggest issue. Barry, what keeps you awake at night? <laughs> now, I probably spend more time worrying about government policy today than ever in my career. And they're just a series of, of government policies with all kinds of implications for our companies and for the capital markets. And, and the law of un unintended consequences is, is always present. And whatever the new regulation is, it, it has an offsetting impact that nobody thought about. Uh, and, and across the board, environmental, fiscal policy, uh, monetary policy for sure, bank <coughs> regulations, they're, they're all uh, significantly more important and often detrimental than ever before. Adam? Well, I can't say the glare of my wife's iPad as she's watching the third <laughs> episode of Breaking Bad in a row. That doesn't work. Um, uh, too much leverage, no triggers on the debt, and mispriced credit. Jim? You know, I'm so pooped. I don't think anything keeps me awake. But <laughs> I have this recurring nightmare. And, um, and because our business is like, you know, that's 25, 50, 75 EBITDA, we're really in this area where sometimes it's an inst institutional demand loan and sometimes it isn't. So my recurring nightmare is that I'm a dried up crab halfway up the beach. Then you've seen him if you've ever been on a beach. And I've got like a document in my left hand, which is a commitment to Barry. And I've got unreturned phone calls from Rick. And the tide has gone out. So that's what... <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> Rick, that's a good that's one. That's a tough one to top. Um, <laughs> I, I think just to, just to be very selfish about our business, uh, I, I think the, 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 the vagaries of, of an economic cycle or capital markets environment, deployment kind of comes and goes with those. It, it is fairly steady. You, can, you know, you have an easier time when markets are rising, putting money to work versus 
uh, when folks are afraid and risk gets repriced, and that's a better time for us to deploy where, where we get our pricing. Uh, I think the, the, the thing that would probably worry me the most is somewhat the, the experience we had in the fourth quarter of 08, first half 09, when it felt like the, the domestic economy stopped. And this is a little bit tied into some of the other comments about fiscal policy and the lack of, of really, you know, the experiment that's going on right now and the potential fallout of that. If you were to get a seizing up of the economy, what I would worry about and what keeps us up at night is that type of economic slowdown and what it would do to our portfolio. Because you'll find stuff to do for the new one and the new, you know, the new environment, the new world that you're lending in. But the, the repeat of that kind of, you know, revenue stopping, revenue generation stop, production, productivity, uh, consumption stopping, uh, it was a frightening thing in the economy. And I think, you know, that kind of extreme would be possibly the thing that would, that would, would worry me the most. You know, I guess one parting comment if we pull up slide eight, right? Um, so you can see here just in, in the slide that roughly the middle market comprises roughly 40% of U.S. GDP. And since 1977, the middle market has provided uh, roughly over 41% of private net job creation. So 1977 to 2011. Uh, looking at this data. You know, one of the interesting things that we're asked to do, or we, we kind of see in the mission of the Milk and Global Conference, is changing the world in uh, innovative ways. And so while people tend to focus on the individual returns or risk, it's really the social impact uh, that I find very impressive. By lending to smaller middle market firms, as these guys do, it allows Americans or it allows these middle market businesses to hire more people, grow, reach more customers and the social benefit uh, more than outweighs uh, the cost. And so we appreciate what you guys do. And so really it's all done by one loan and, and uh, one deal at a time. And so with that, we'll conclude. Thank you so much for your time.